Thank you, Victoria, for that uh, introduction and wonderful to be here and have so many people joining us from all over the world to look at how do we take action on domestic and family violence and following on from our last speaker, the importance of men taking strong action. I have the pleasure of moderating the discussion today. My name's Elizabeth Broderick. I'm the founder of the Male Champions of Change strategy, which is a strategy that originated in Australia around about 11 years ago. And it's now grown to a global strategy, a global coalition of over 260 CEOs around the globe. We work with influential leaders to advance gender equality, not just within their organizations, but also within their spheres of influence. Um, and I'm also the UN's independent expert and special rapporteur um, on the working group on discrimination against women and girls. But I'm delighted today to be joined with my colleague, by my colleague, um, Matt Common, who's the CEO of one of the largest banks in Australia, the Commonwealth Bank of Australia. And he's one of our outstanding champions of change. So Matt, thank you so much for joining us this morning, particularly as it's 4.30 a.m. down here in Australia. Um, and that's a pretty big call, but it's wonderful to have you with us. Thanks very much, In the Liz. time we have together, you. we'll explore the issue of domestic and family violence. We will examine why domestic and family violence is a workplace issue, but most importantly, what is the role that organisations can play in combating domestic and family violence? And we started to experiment with different strategies about seven years ago. We had spent quite a deal of time on working to lift the underrepresentation of women in our nation, in Australia at leadership level, but we quickly came to understand that one of the main barriers to women's full and equal participation in public life, and particularly in working life, was the levels of violence against women existing, let's face it, in all countries of the world, but also in Australia. So our journey started by listening to the experiences of courageous victim survivors. They spoke to us about what it was like to live with violence, live in an abusive relationship while trying to hold down a job. They talked about the impact of this on their work. They told us things such as um, their partner hiding the keys to the car so they couldn't get to work. One woman talked about her partner cutting the heels off her shoes because he didn't like the fact that she wore high heels to work. Or another whose partner used to throw milk all over the floor and demand she clean it up before she left for work. Another survivor told us about sharing an office with a work colleague and her husband would routinely ring um, this survivor and abuse her down the telephone. And on this particular occasion, when her husband did this and the call had finished, her work colleague turned to her and said, we shouldn't have to take calls from abusive customers like that. This survivor turned to her work colleague and she said, no, that was no customer, that was my husband. And sadly, that work colleague, because they weren't experienced in how to um, uh, respond to a disclosure, I didn't know what to do and the subject was never mentioned again. We also heard from women about how their workplaces didn't offer the support they needed. And for many of them, they lost jobs that they loved. The workplace lost incredibly talented women. And as one woman who had lost her son to family violence when her husband murdered her son, as one woman told um, our champions, she said, prior to my son's death, no one at work wanted to hear my story. Now everyone does. And that was just a sad reflection for all of us because it just reminded us that when women with violence speak, the system doesn't listen. And every one of us, every one of us who's in a workplace, who's an employer, we run the system. What affects employees affects employers. And now as champions of change, we have come to understand that being safe at work is deeply connected to being safe at home. They're part of a single continuum. And I'd have to say that's even more relevant today um, due to the pandemic. So here in Australia, one in four women have experienced domestic and family violence. 62% of those women are in paid work. And there's no question that there's a clear role for the workplace in addressing that violence. Um, in the early years, we largely focused on support 
for our employees who were survivors of domestic violence or who were currently experiencing it in our workplace. Uh, and the reason for that is we know that economic independence is one of the greatest predictors of whether a woman or a person will leave a relationship. So keeping victims attached to the labour market is just so critical. But more recently, we've stepped into kind of uncharted territory and we're starting to address those in our workplaces who are also perpetrators of domestic and family violence. Research in several countries shows that perpetrators are often distracted at work, leading to safety risks. Um, not only that, they're using their work time and our work resources to perpetrate violence against their partner. So in 2022, we've stepped up both with survivors, but also uh, with perpetrators. The workplace can play a really important role. And in fact, 85% of our members now have in place support for employees um, experiencing domestic violence, but also for those uh, in response to those who use or may use domestic and family violence. Um, now, there's no better person to talk about this issue uh, than Matt Common, who I'm joined with today. He is an absolute leader in our country, and I'd, I'd suggest uh, across the world in addressing domestic and family violence as a workplace issue. So I'd like to now bring Matt into the conversation to really share the work that Commonwealth Bank has been leading. So welcome, Matt. And I just wonder if I could start by asking you why you, as leader of Commonwealth Bank and your organisation, um, why you... Uh, care about domestic and family violence as a workplace issue? Why do you believe it is a workplace issue? And what do other leaders need to do? Well, thanks, Liz. And again, very, great to be with uh, you and the broader audience wherever um, you might be joining. Look, I mean, a lot of the things that you've touched on were, were very clear and evident uh, to us. And, uh, you know, for a long time, we've been very focused on you know, gender equality, equality more broad, broadly, an inclusive, respectful workplace. And of course, some of the gender and inequality issues actually lie, unfortunately, at the heart of what we observe more broadly in terms of uh, domestic and family violence. And so uh, we, we see a very natural role for us as a significant employer in Australia. As you said, we're the largest financial institution. We're the second largest company in Australia. Uh, we, of course, have a large uh, and diverse workforce. And I guess from our perspective, we could see both the the social uh, community benefits, benefits for our staff, of course, the broader economic benefits uh, as well. And also, and also, I think some of the uncomfortable truths that, that, that you touched on, that in a large organisation, we serve millions of customers, we've got tens of thousands of people who are working for us. The reality is, whilst there are victims and survivors there, there are also perpetrators. And you know, we really wanted to more deeply understand the issue. It's an issue that... Um, I think concerns many of us uh, greatly. It's an area that inside the organisation is, you know, very passionate. So we've had you know, a lot of continued support from our own employees, uh, you know, just like sustainability garners enormous, I think, employee engagement and discretionary effort. I think this topic uh, being seen to be and actually being a leader in the Australian context for both our people and for our customers and for the broader community and so this has now been part of a, a multi-year effort and investment to try and make sure that we're playing our part alongside other large employers, government and a number of uh, community and social organisations. And Matt, I know um, from watching uh, Commonwealth Bank, you have been on a journey um, and you first started um, working on this issue several years ago. I just wonder if you could talk to us about what action you took when you first started, how you built that, you know, coalition of people stepping up in a really big way. So, yeah. Yeah, no, happy to, Liz. I, I think from our perspective, we really uh, galvanised efforts probably from about 2015. And I think you, you touched on one of the uh, people's story. There's a... a very well known now, um, you know, uh, despite the tragic circumstances, a lady who was um, Australian of the Year in 2015 uh, and her son was murdered, as you touched on, Liz. And that, I think, really was a very significant catalyst and inflection point, in my view, in the broader Australian community. It shone an enormous amount of 
you know, additional light on a, you know, very concerning uh, and escalating issue in the Australian context. And I, I think it caused many people in Australia and certainly the Commonwealth Bank and the, the senior leaders at the time to think deeply about the issue and to try and understand it. And as I said, first of all, really looking internally and making sure we had what well, at least we could see or benchmarked ourselves against best in class workplace policies, awareness, uh, action, support, which has gone on to be extended to things like, you know, unpaid, uh, unlimited paid uh, leave for uh, domestic and family violence victims. So a lot of work internally in our own processes. And then we started just thinking about how can we best provide support to our customers. Um, and some of that support, uh, you know, certainly has evolved over time. When we first started, our big focus was actually trying to support customers um, in a, you know, very secu- severe or acute set of circumstances, um, particularly for those who perhaps didn't have the resources to be able to escape or for a range of different uh, aspects um, uh, where we could see clear financial abuse that was being associated uh, with that as well. And so basically what we tried to do was set up uh, a service to our customers initially where we provide um, free financial assistance. We'd partnered with a large uh, telecommunications company. We partnered with a uh, a large retailer, and we're basically providing, you know, financial s- solutions and, and financial grants, as well as, you know, essential support to help people through that crisis situation. Uh, and that's where we started, and we evolved that. Um, you know, when we first launched that service, you know, unfortunately, uh, we were inundated in terms of the demand uh, for that service. We had a number of people coming to us, people who either actually also didn't bank with the the Commonwealth Bank, and that really, I guess, we could see a window into the scale of an issue which is, you know, not well understood or widely, uh, you know, estimated. And so that really gave us sort of pause for thought about what would be the most optimal area for us to be able to scale our involvement and effort, whether sort of, you know, crisis uh, recovery or actually perhaps, um, which is where we've moved on to more recently, whether we can play a bigger and broader role in, um, you know, broader sustainability and uh, recovery for victim survivors. And I know, Matt, one of the things Commonwealth Bank has done is you've also identified not only working with your staff internally, looking at all your policies and procedures, the unlimited um, paid domestic violence leave and, and all the other things, the flexible work, leaving a bag at, at being able to leave a bag at work, all those things. Um, but you've recognised that actually your technology can be used as a vehicle for abuse um, of women, you know, uh, and particularly women, because this, remember this is about gender inequality. Um, I think that's one of the things that um, Commonwealth Bank has done, which most others haven't, is understood how the services you offer can be used to perpetrate abuse. I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. Happy to, Liz. And I mean, there's a few elements of the current program and support, which perhaps we'll, we'll, we'll come back on and we can we can touch on. But yes, that, that was one of the concerning and alarming things that we uh, we came across. One of our team and our uh, community wellbeing team dealing with a, a customer uh, and actually it was sort of brought to our attention that uh, they were being abused by a perpetrator using uh, payment rails. And so, I mean, it's consistently in most parts of the world when you send a, a payment account to account across the financial system, there's different mechanisms or rails to be able to send that payment. But you're uh, often able to accompany a payment with a message, you know, and typically that might be an invoice number or the na- your name. Uh, but actually what we saw in this particular circumstance was um, uh, the perpetrator was sending lots of very small transactions with abusive, threatening, intimidating, unlawful uh, messages. And so obviously we uh, identified and worked with uh, you know, law enforcement around that particular matter, but it also caused us to then say, well, if that's happening in this individual circumstance, then how's that happening more broadly? Um, and I guess we were really surprised by uh, certainly the inappropriate comments that were being sent uh, across payment rails, but also then, as you said, using a combination of um, 
you know, machine learning and AI models to try and better triangulate and then understand and look for different patterns of potential uh, abuse. And then we've refined and tuned that algorithm uh, over time. We've used it obviously to help support our customers um, and also identify, intercept, prevent, block, and in some cases also work with law enforcement. We also um, had the opportunity to take that to the Australian Banking um, Association just as an idea, which I, you know, was enthusiastically embraced by other financial institutions as well. So. I mean, it was certainly a really good example and learning for us about something that we frankly hadn't contemplated. You know, as a larger employer providing a number of different services, how might those services be misused in a way that is, you know, underpinning, you know, a number of uh, threats and attacks um, that are being carried out by uh, perpetrators around the country? Yeah, I think it, just the power of, at an organization like yours leading then to catalyze the whole sector because if people are misusing the commonwealth bank's banking system to abuse partners then it's likely it's happening elsewhere and i think the scale of the issue that you uncovered here in australia um, was was inc you know incredibly large and i think it's just a great reminder for every employer to check how could my service or my product or my offering be misused in a way which could perpetrate violence um, but we've, what we've seen, and I see some good questions coming up here as well, so I'll intersperse them um, with my questions. And please um, look to put your questions up on the Q&A on the right-hand side of your panel. Um, what we know, um, Matt, is that, uh, that COVID-19, the pandemic, has increased in every region of the world, um, the prevalence of domestic and family violence, and, and in some regions, the severity of it. I mean... What what changes have you seen and what things has Commonwealth Bank done to try and respond to this increase in domestic and family violence? Yeah, so a few things, and maybe I'll just sort of quickly touch on the program that we've rolled out and that we're in the process of scaling even more in Australia, and that's really sort of coincided certainly with the duration of the pandemic. And, and we've certainly seen, as you said, Liz, an, an escalation, unfortunately, uh, in the issue. And so, you know, really uh, over time, uh, where we've evolved the program is we have a you know a financial independence hub where we work with uh, specialist external uh, support. We provide one-on-one -on -one coaching, counselling, you know a lot of uh, strategies to help uh, victim survivors um, re-establish a new life. We help coordinate with external uh, services. We provide uh, interest-free uh, loans. So that's sort of one part of what we do. We also have an internal community wellbeing team as well, which works, you know, at a larger scale with it, with customers, you know, right across the country. I should say the first service is available for um, for everyone, not just those that uh, the bank with us um, at the Commonwealth uh, Bank obviously funds and invests that, and then the community uh, wellbeing team, which works with tens of thousands of customers provides again that support and particularly helps to connect a, a network of different services and one of the things that we've um, worked on and really benefited because there's been you know a, an increasing focus right across all sectors of the community is a number of different uh, partners that we're able to work with and so we're working both with you know academia we've done um, recently a, a serve or well, some research that we commissioned that Deloitte did just trying to estimate and understand the scale of uh, financial abuse and what the economic impacts are, you know, assuming obviously for, for a moment or putting to the side that the devastating social and community uh, impacts. And that's really helped um, to shine even a light M most recently on just the, the scale uh, of that issue. We've worked with a number of different partners that we've experimented with everything from, you know, job referral and, and, and placement services, uh, we've worked with companies that help work on things like, you know, building CVs, because as you said, sometimes that's been, you know, abuse has been accompanied by both financial, physical abuse, and also, uh, you know, a lack of confidence, uh, periods out of the, the workforce. And so we've worked with partners to help on, you know, CV, interview skills, preparing for and, and you know, and seeking uh, employment. And then I think, look, specifically through COVID, as I said, uh, we've rolled out those services. We've 
gotten more confidence that we'll be able to deliver the services reliably uh, at scale. And so we've helped, you know, more than 22,000 people in our community and uh, wellbeing team. We commissioned this research recently from Deloitte, which showed that it was the economic benefit, uh, impacts from financial abuse, $5.7 billion of the Australian economy uh, directly and another $5 billion uh, indirectly, which, um, you know, is a very large, uh, clear uh, social cost. We've now launched the largest ever financial abuse uh, awareness campaign in Australia across, you know, all media channels, including obviously our own, just to shine a light on the issue, understanding awareness, making it clear that everyone can uh, come to the Commonwealth Bank and, and seek support and assistance. Um, I would say as well, there's been a lot of work that's been done both at the state and, and at the, the federal level, some very, I think, significant programs and funding that I'm attending uh, one of those on Friday morning, actually, with the uh, the minister responsible for the, for the federal government. So, you know, I, I do feel at the least there is an, a heightened level of awareness and understanding. I think the magnitude of the issue, both uh, socially, as I said, as well as economically is much better understood. I think there's a range of strategies, but realistically it's gonna take an, an enormous and coordinated effort across a number of sectors of the community. I mean, ideally to eliminate and certainly make a significant reduction. Thanks, Matt. You're so right on that. It needs everyone to stand up. Um, and, you know, the business sector and employers are such an important part of a response. I mean, one of the things I've noticed that Commonwealth Bank has done well is that you're really engaged with feminist organisations in this country. So you've gone out and proactively sought their advice. You've also gone out to those who work with men's behavioural change programs to say, OK, in relation to a response to perpetrators, um, can you give us some advice? Because I know where we started was we um, originally thought, well, anyone who perpetrates any form of abuse or violence should be immediately dismissed from our organisations. That was our starting point. I think the feminist organisations have taught us, and I know they taught Commonwealth Bank as well, that actually you need a more nuanced response because often that individual man is the sole breadwinner into the family and actually exiting them from the organisation could make the abuse worse. So I know you have a principle there, which is do no harm, particularly it's a um, you know human-centred or victim-centred approach. So the well-being of a woman is put at the centre of a response. And I think maybe we wouldn't have got there so quickly if we hadn't engaged so deeply with feminist organisations and others. And I think maybe just from for, for the message out to employers today is, you know, there's so many great pieces of advice in civil society organisations, um, engagement and being willing to listen and learn from them is really important. I don't know whether you have a comment on that at all, Matt. No, I mean, I look like just reinforce and echo what you've said, Liz. I mean, it is very much a victim-centred approach. It should and it needs to be. We've been able to work, as you said, with lots of different aspects of the community from sort of uh, university-led sort of academic research uh, a variety of different uh, partners. You know, we've also been, um, yeah, because it is such an important issue and one that touches so many different parts of the community, we've been thrilled with the number of people that have been prepared to come forward, share their stories, give up their time, work with us on, you know, a whole range of different, uh, both sort of resources, understanding, uh, as well as some of, you know, very, very severe and, um, uh, you know, very confronting situations that people have been in. They've been prepared to share those stories, do that publicly, work on, uh, you know, podcasts with us, uh, you know, a lot of educational material. And so, you know, I, I do think that it is part of a, you know, broader level of understanding. And I think even, you know, for us as an organization, we've gone through, we've now gone through and surveyed all of our people more broadly around sort of respect and inclusive uh, practices, understanding their lived experience, we're trying to really focus more around in and around prevention, you know, mm -hmm. setting a very clear standard around what's a respectful uh, workplace, helping them to understand the subtleties that like microaggressions and how they can be, you know, misinterpreted. Mm -hmm. We've gone through education around bystander training, you know, for all people inside an organisation, uh, you know, and we're trying to really get to the root cause and the heart of, I think, some of the 
behaviors and, and practices and, and perhaps sort of mindsets and beliefs that can manifest, you know, not in all cases, but certainly can sometimes manifest in, you know, very negative uh, behaviors mm-hmm. that we've been talking about here. And Matt, I'm just going to one uh, one of the questions on the poll now. And this, um, uh, uh, the person asking the question, Maria, um, has um, very uh, it correctly called out women with disability because, of course, all you know, we know that there are groups of women who will experience domestic and family violence or violence against women to a much higher degree than other um, groups of women. So, um, women with disability have had you know, have higher rates. And not only that, their um, issues during the pandemic um, have, have caused, as, as Maria points out, you know, a lot of mental health issues. So how can we empower women who have been the victim of abuse and who are disabled um, to also feel safe? Um, so you talked about your advisory, you know, the, the unit that you've set up, which works with women. Do you have any particular thing um, approaches to women with disabilities? We certainly have that as a target and as a support service. I think it's an excellent question. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's something that we realistically have to continue to come back to and look at over time, whether because if you see levels of sort of underrepresentation, then we sort of must be thinking about, well, are we really as accessible? Is there awareness there? What are some of the barriers that would be overcoming that? I think the hypothesis that you set out, Liz, is exactly uh, right. Um, and, and potentially it's harder for, for those victim survivors to feel confident to be able to reach out and you know, re- require request that level of support and access is potentially harder for us to, to understand and discover that. And so I think that's, a, that's an appropriate and a very good challenge uh, to us to sort of go away and then over time look at some of the, you know, the subsectors of the uh, victim survivor community and make sure that we're sort of tailoring and um, matching our, you know, awareness and services appropriately to, you know, all levels of the community. Thanks, Matt. And another question coming through is, um, and I think you raised it early on. I mean, for many in the community, even many potentially in your bank, they see domestic and family violence as a physical issue. Oh, you know, someone's got a black eye, someone's showing bruises. Bruises. How can we help people understand the dimensions of violence and that it's not just physical violence? And, of course, you've done a good job on um, seeing economic abuse, financial abuse that can be equally devastating. I mean, is is that a journey that you've been on? And I just wonder if any remarks about that. Well, yeah, I mean, look, I, I think it's a, that's a really important point. I think as we've seen, uh, you know, financial ab- abuse is, is certainly, um, you know, prevalent in the vast majority of cases that end in physical violence, but it's more than just the, the physical uh, violence. As I said, the, the abuse, the intimidation, the disempowerment that's accom- accompanied with uh, financial abuse and you know we see people in those sorts of relationships I mean you mentioned some of the behaviors um, which is there to sort of threaten and undermine and you know weaken people's uh, confidence as well as sort of abuse and intimidate but often that can be accompanied with uh, you know partners taking out uh, loans perhaps that they're, they're not deriving any primary purpose they're being saddled with uh, debt they can you know be in situations where they're the primary uh, income generator but also their partners abusing them in a financial sense and actually you know taking uh the earnings often with the threat or the overhang of a physical uh abuse and so i think that was one of the reasons why we've really tried to hone in on financial abuse because i mean we're we're really probably the you know the natural institution in my view uh to really do the leading work being the largest financial institution in the country and you know, if not us, then who? And so that's where we really try to channel a lot of our uh, efforts and resources into exactly what the issue is, how widespread it is, how man- how it manifests, you know, what, and then how to sort of think about it, get support, and then hopefully, uh, you know, move upstream more into sort of prevention and behavioural change to uh, see a dramatic reduction in, you know, some of the, you know, the really serious cases of, you know, physical uh, mm. violence, which often uh, is, is what is, uh, you know, is covered more broadly 
in the media. Well, thanks so much, Matt, for making the time to join us for this session and for what's been a really interesting and instructive discussion and to share your expertise on the issue. And, and you know, as someone who lives in this country, Australia, can I thank you so much for your leadership in this area? Um, and finally, a warm thank you to everyone that's joined us in the session today. Um, thank you for your questions. I hope that our discussion has given you some practical tools. If you want more information, on the work of the Champions of Change on this topic, please go to our website, which is at www.championsofchangecoalition.org. Um, and thank you to everyone and have a wonderful day. Thank you.